Support comes from New York State United Teachers, a union of professionals standing with more than 600,000 workers in education, human services, and health care with the Our Voice, Our Values, Our Union campaign. And United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, UUPinfo.org. It's the Capital Connection. Hi, I'm Alan Chartok. Joining us this week is Jay Jacobs, chair of the New York State Democratic Committee. Welcome, Jay. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Well, thanks for having me on. So tell me what you do. Well, I do a lot of navigating. (laughs) I would say that I... I, uh try very much uh, to promote the Democratic Party, keep us out of hot water uh, when you know things uh, get troublesome, keep people together as best I possibly can, uh, make sure that um, voters are getting an opportunity to know what the Democratic Party stands for, and finding candidates is a big part of what I do. Then, you know, helping to run the elections in terms of getting our campaigns organized, raising money and the rest, um, and doing strategy. That, that takes up a good chunk of my time. Is it a hard job? Oh, it's, it is a hard job, but I enjoy it very much. I, I think that um, if you if you let the stresses get to you, it could be really hard. Uh, everybody's got a criticism. Uh, everybody's got a complaint. Um, you're the you're the person in this job that has to say no um, and, and tell people uh, disappoint people at times. Everybody wants something from you, and you're dealing with competing. Uh, constituencies and competing factions. So, you know, pulling all that together, you got to keep calm. Uh, you got to keep uh, your wits about you. But again, I find it exciting and invigorating, and I, I enjoy it. The Democratic Party has often been described as a circular firing squad. Is that true? Yeah, I think it is. But the good yeah. news is, it seems yeah. that the Republicans have learned from us, and now they are too. That's very funny. Let's go to a couple of things. Obviously, the big thing on your plate now is that Governor Cuomo is fighting his way out of a mess. Yep. And I take it that the telephone works two ways and that he calls you and you call him. Can you let us in on any of that? Well, you know, without giving you specifics of our conversations, we do talk. And and I do offer him advice and uh, give him perspective uh, at times of what I'm seeing or, or hearing and feeling. Um, so I do that, and he, you know, he, and he does ask for advice. And um, I, I would say to you that um, my my approach from the beginning has been uh, to to um, stand for due process. I, I want to hear all of the facts before I make a decision. You know, my real job, where I actually earn a living, is I'm a summer camp director, director of a summer camp, and and I deal with a lot right. of conflict all of the time. And, and one of the things I've learned is that the first thing you hear is not necessarily the whole story. It doesn't mean that it, it is untrue, and I'm not saying that anything that any of the people who have made allegations are untrue, but you need to get the whole story so that you understand the entire picture. And I've always lived by that in every um, uh, situation, and I find that it's, it, it's been a, a successful way to do it. And that's what I, I counseled in, in this circumstance. So let, let's see what the investigations show, and then we'll make a determination of what the next steps ought to be. Now, Jay Jacobs, we have something in common. I went to Hunter College in the Bronx. That meant you get on the subway in the morning and you went home. But really, my education came at Bronx House Emanuel Camps in Copic, <laughs> New York. Oh, sure. And I have to say, I was there for many, many years. And how did you get into the camping business? Well, I mean, my my uh, parents sent me to camp early on, and then uh, uh, my my father was a single parent, and I, I lived with my father, and we had to go. To, I had to go to camp, um, and I wasn't the, the best model camper. I wasn't athletic. I was overweight. I was one of those kids who didn't have it easy in camp, and I didn't really uh, love it until I got some really great friends, and I stayed at camp, and then I ended up working at camp, and I went off to law school, but still managed to spend time in the summers coming back to camp at part of the summer to work. Uh, ultimately, when I was 23, the camp director at the camp that I was working at wanted to sell. Uh, I had no money, but he liked me. We made a, a deal with virtually no money down. I took over the camp um, uh, when I was 24. Where was the camp? Where is the camp and what's its name? 
Case anybody it's Timberlake wants to... Camp. It's in the Catskill oh, Mountains. Yeah, and then after Timberlake, a uh, number of years later, I bought another one and another one, and now I've got uh, three sleepaway camps, three day camps, and uh, two country inns and a foundation. So it's really a, we wow. built it up. But I still I still direct every summer Timberlake Camp. I'm there with my shorts and my polo style shirt on and <laughs> doing my uh, doing my thing. That's great. So let's go back to Cuomo for a moment. Obviously, he has agreed with all of these investigations. I've been predicting for a while that he was going to weather the storm and that he was going to end up running for a fourth term. You think that's entirely out of the question now? I don't think it's out of the question. I think a lot really depends upon how these investigations pan out. I think it kind of depends not so much even on the actual wording of the report per se. I think it depends upon how it's interpreted by first the Democrats in New York State and then secondarily by the voters at large. And I think polling will be an indication of that. And I think the governor, you know, is pretty astute and understands polling. And he'll take a look at it as well. If it, if it doesn't look like there's a shot, I don't think he'd go for it. But if he feels there's a reasonable shot, I think he, 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 he might. But we have to just wait and see. You know, Jay Jacobs, um, I, I have to say uh, you have an unenviable position in that you have to make this whole thing go smoothly. Nevertheless, I've always believed you can't beat someone with no one. And I don't know who's going to run against them, either in a primary or in a Republican general election. Have you been, I'll bet you've been thinking about it, but anything you want to share? Yeah, w- without being meaning to be arrogant, and, and I, you know, I, I always try to avoid that as best I can, and this may sound arrogant, um, I'm, I'm less worried about the contest between the Democrats and the Republicans in November than I am worried about what a primary looks like in in June. And now, if uh, Governor Cuomo were to choose to run for election and that were viable based upon polling, I think that there would be um, a few uh, uh, takers, uh, people to take him on. I just don't see it. Um, if he feels strong enough to run for re-election and the polling indicates that you know he's got a good crack at it, with seventeen million dollars in the bank, and the connections he has, and the power of the of the governor's seat, I don't see anybody uh, uh, realistically taking him on. He, you'll have somebody, perhaps from the left, you know that's that's happened before, but sure, he'll do okay. Right. But if, if the governor were to decide not to run, or if the governor for some reason were not in office and uh, Kathy Hochul were the governor, um, then I think we're going to see some uh, potential primaries that could be interesting. Oh, yeah. And, and we have to see how it goes. That's where navigating – the first thing I, I uh, pointed to when you asked me the question at the beginning of the uh, interview, that's where navigating comes in. Uh, stormy waters to navigate. So there are those people who mentioned the attorney general, uh, an independent elected person, the controller. Obviously, you talk to them, too. If they ask you whether they should go into a primary, what are you going to tell them? Well, first of all, they're all very talented and very capable. And so there are a lot of lot of good options, you know, assuming the field were cleared, assuming the governor were not running for reelection. Um, you know, you've got Kathy Hochul, who's lieutenant governor. Um, you know, she's uh, very, very talented, very capable. Um, and you have, of course, it's just James. And, you know, you've got people in the suburbs that are looking to run. Um, I know that, that, that Swazi uh, has looked at it and uh, Ballone and, uh, and then there may, there may be others. Um, uh, de Blasio uh, has uh, made mention of it as himself. So Mayor de Blasio, that is. So I, I think that people have to just um, take a, a realistic look. Very often people look at these races and they're not realistic in terms of what is the makeup of a of the Democratic uh, vote and how are you going to appeal to a large enough faction of that vote in a multi-candidate race to be the person who comes out with the plurality ahead or a majority if you should be so lucky. Um, that's, that's, a tough, uh, that's, a, that's a tough thing to uh, – to try to figure out, but I'll I'll be talking to each of the people who are interested in it. I'm sure if they want to talk with me, and I'll be giving them my best advice. Are you familiar with the invisible ink that's in the state constitution? There's invisible ink that says if you want to be to win an election in New York State and you're a Democrat, you better come from the five boroughs as opposed to Buffalo or one of those other places. Have you seen that? Are you after, maybe I give you a <laughs> magic potion that you, you yeah. put over the Constitution. Well, I, I know that is the city centric view, but, you know, and, and by the way, that may have been something that was uh, significant years ago. 
I, I don't think voters anymore care that much about where somebody comes from. I think they care far more about the, the, the nature of uh, the um, the argument they're running on, uh, how compelling it is, how uh, how how it touches them personally. I think that campaigns are far more about generating an emotional response among voters than they are to determine whether you come from, you know, Peekskill or Poughkeepsie or Patchog or mm. wherever it may be. It doesn't make a difference. I don't think mm. so. What grade would you give to President Biden's joint address to Congress? I think he did excellent. I think he came across excellently. I liked his message. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that the thing that you know it surprises me, I saw that the polling, you know, before the uh, speech polling, he's like at about fifty-two, fifty-three percent popularity. I, I don't know what it takes to make people in this country happy, because I, I have to say that the tone that this guy has set, the uh, maybe I'm just seeing it differently, and other people, you know, on the Republican side of the aisle can't see this. This is a good, decent guy. Period. I mean, that's it. He is, and that's how he came across last night. Do you ever talk to him? Not since he's president. I've I've talked to him before, and um, you know, I've been with him numbers of times, met him numbers of times, but not not since he's president. No, I, I'm not on the uh, on the list of people he needs to call for advice these days. <laughs> okay, so we learned this week from the census data that New York will lose one congressional seat, go down from 27 Congress people to 26, after falling short by. 89 people. That must have been a kick in the gut for you, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, I, I, and I, I saw my uh, my colleague uh, on the Republican side, Nick Langworthy, who's a friend, and I, you know, I, I, I enjoy his company. But he, he has these statements. He made this out to be like, oh my God, this just establishes and proves what he's been saying that because of Cuomo, people are fleeing the state of New York. The state of New York went up 4.2 percent in population. It's now over 20 million. It's 20 million 250 thousand. About it was 19 million previously, and so. You know, we haven't lost population. We've increased population. Unfortunately, not enough. Now, when you think about losing out by 89 votes or 89 people in the census, well, why did that happen? First of all, there were at least 89 people down in Boca Raton, Florida, hiding out from the pandemic. You know, I'm sure weren't counted. But even more than that, you know, Nick Langworthy's uh, uh uh, the president that he supported uh, uh, with great enthusiasm did such a job on the census uh, and trying to, you know, push it down. And, and, and that's why we have a lower count. He's responsible for that more than anybody else. Not not Cuomo for the 89 people that we missed. That That's the Trump census. And that was Nick Langworthy's, uh, you know, candidate. So, you know, I, I just love when the, the, he'll use any uh, he'll, he'll make up down and down up. He'll do anything he can to, to make a criticism out of it. But it's a, it's a darn shame that by 89 people, we lose a seat uh, and instead of Minnesota. I think Minnesota would have been the state to lose the seat. Of course, a lot of people didn't come to the door because you're supposed to count every person, but they didn't want, you know, the ICE people taking them away. So That's certainly right. there were more than 89 people doing that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Had this been a, a census done in a normal year, with a normal president, you know, then I don't think we would have lost that seat. So, Jake Jacobs, chair of the Democratic Party, tell us what you're going to do about which seat gets eliminated. Remember, you've got Democratic majorities in both the Senate and the Assembly. What are you going to do? Well, uh, they're going to be driving the, uh, the redistricting. And, um, you know, if I have any input, um, I'm going to be you – know, we've got to take a look at when we get it in September – exactly where within the state the population dropped. I am not a big fan of um, a partisan-driven gerrymandering process. I never have been. Uh, I know we could take advantage of the position that we're in. Uh, I just don't believe, you know, that's the kind of good government that I've I've always felt is, is needed. And so now if you're in the position to do it and, and you do it, then really what are you, you know? So from my standpoint, while I, I, I'm not going to uh, advise that we keep the districts the way they are, because that was a, a result of the Republican Senate, uh, used to be the sure. majority of the Republicans in the Senate. That was the, the, their, their efforts to carve and cut to, to make the districts as good as possible for them. That I would undo, but I'd be very mindful to make sure that communities of interest uh, are respected, um, 
racial ethnic diversity is respected as it should be under the Constitution, and the districts are as compact and intelligently drawn, reasonably drawn uh, as possible so that you've got fair districts. And the more competitive districts we have, that's fine by me. I, I'm, I'll take my licks uh, and, and my lumps, I should say, uh, nope. and I'll... I'll go with a fair competitive district here and there. Now, we do allegedly have a commission that does this work, but in the end, the legislature has to approve it. So do you think there's any conflict between the people in the legislature and the commission? Well, I don't know yet. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's always the stakes are so high, there's always going to be a conflict. So I don't see this being smooth or easy. It never is. And I don't know why it would be now. So I, I think that there'll probably have to be some wrangling uh, between, uh, you know, the commission and, and the legislature. But, uh, but ultimately, uh, they'll, they'll come out with a good result because the alternative is you end up in court and then, you know, all bets are off. So it's in everybody's interest to get this right. There's so many Democrats in New York State as opposed to Republicans. So even if you're fair, and I think I have great respect for you, Jay, for saying that, you can't lose if there's any kind of fair redistricting, whereas the Republicans... You know, they got to save the few seats that they've got a hold of. Yeah, uh, it, we do. We do have the advantage. But I, I want to remind everybody that, you know, uh, in my office, uh, I have a model of the Titanic. It's really a very nice model of the ship. And I wow. keep it there because the Titanic is the greatest example of human arrogance in our in our history. Mm -hmm. um, the unsinkable ship who didn't make it through its first you know, voyage. And I, I always want to caution us as Democrats, even though the numbers are high, it, we, this could change in a snap second. Not the enrollment, but voters, are, and particularly in New York, they're intelligent, and they know what they're looking for. And as, as soon as we be, begin to believe that, you know, we've got the power and we can do whatever we want, that's when it's all going to change and we're going to hit that iceberg. So we've got to be careful. And um, I, I remind Democrats and voters everywhere that – this can turn around, and uh, I don't take that advantage for granted. Yeah, you know, when you say that, the first person who comes to my mind is, of course, your friend, Governor Cuomo, because obviously nobody was riding higher in the polls and everywhere else while Trump was the president. And all of a sudden, whoosh, we all learn something from that, don't we, that it can change in a second and a half. Right. And look, look at Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, sure. California, the most Democratic state. Uh, we have and look at the difficulties he's having right now. He just uh, don't take it for granted. Don't be arrogant. Um, yes, advance your agenda, advance your programs best you can. But we always have to remember that y whether you have the majority or not, you have to respect the minority. You may not have to agree with them, and I don't in many many things, but you have to respect them, and uh, and that's an important part of this whole political process. Speaking of which, Jay Jacobs, did you ever think you'd see a day when there were Democratic supermajorities in both houses of the legislature? Well, I mean, no, I, I didn't think I'd see it a uh, supermajority. I knew we'd get to a majority because, just because of the numbers in enrollment. And I, and I also, not just that, but I, I thought that our messaging would sooner or later uh, capture the imagination of voters and uh, win us a majority. Supermajority is another story. I think a, a very big part of that is, uh, you know, it, it, it came on the heels of Trump. Um, you know, I, I always say to be my kid, I said, Donald Trump is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in politics. Because I'm public radio races because of that guy, you know, <laughs> right. Th then you can imagine I never I never attribute it to any great, uh, you know, strategic genius on my part. Uh, it, it really is Donald Trump. So uh, I'm glad we got it. Now let's hold on to it. And the way you hold on to it is just don't get arrogant. Now, you're from Nassau County, you, where you're the Democratic Party chair. Democrats have made gains on Long Island where Republicans used to rule. In fact, I just was talking about that in a column. Somebody, you know, used to move from Queens to Long Island. They would change their le registration <laughs> because they wanted to be in the, with a the majority. That isn't true anymore. How'd that happen? I think what what happened is, number one, remember, they had to change their registration because uh, Nassau was such a Republican uh, county that you couldn't get a building permit for anything you wanted to do or variance. Your kids yeah. couldn't get a job at the county or town right. parks to, to be a lifeguard if you were not a Republican. And so people would just change. But you can change your registration, but that doesn't mean you're changing your philosophy or changing the way you're going to vote when you get into the privacy of the voting booth, uh, as we had in those days. So um, uh, between that and the fact that 
you know, uh, Nassau County is a modern suburban county in the sense that its voters and its citizens are highly educated. And um, and I think uh, they are moderate, most certainly, uh, regardless of registration, uh, with more people coming in from the city now and um, the uh, the aging population that was leaning a bit more conservative, uh, moving out or uh, no longer around, it, we became more democratic. So sometime uh, a number of years ago, probably about 10 years ago, registration flipped and Democrats began uh, taking over as the uh, larger party. And now we're significantly ahead. We're almost 100,000 voters ahead now in Nassau County. How about legalized marijuana? Well, you know, in the beginning, everything that's new makes a difference. And then the world levels off. And we go on and you look back and you say, I can't believe it never was. It's kind of like, remember, prohibition, you know, at, at a certain point in time, you know, in 33, I think it was when uh, it ended um, it, 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 under Roosevelt, I think uh, the the um, the country survived it. At the beginning, it was bumpy and I suspect and then it went fine. And I, I'll I'll say that um, the same thing will be with legalized marijuana. Um, we'll get the hang of it. And um, I, I think it's a good thing because when we look at all of the troubles in, in law enforcement and everything that we have to be doing, adding something like uh, dealing with uh, marijuana as an illegal substance and all of the, uh, uh, the, the arrests and the, uh, and the prison uh, you know, population, et cetera, it, yeah. it's just not worth it. It's just not worth it. So it's good that we, we've done this. And I know that some people are nervous about it. I think we've got to deal with the issue of how we make sure that we can test for it. You know, as a driver, it could be intoxicated by alcohol. It could be intoxicated if you use the term uh, for, for pot. We have to be able to figure that out. But I think it's a good thing. Let me ask you about ethics reform. State Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins has been talking about this. Dot, 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 really? <laughs> I mean, if they're after Andrew Cuomo, let's put it on the table. What are they going to do, I mean, when ethics reform applies to them? Yeah, well, ethics, you know, in government uh, it can get complicated. And particularly, you know, you deal with a legislature which, um, in fairness for the job that they do, I'm not so sure that they're adequately paid if that's the only job they can do. Now, there's, you know, of course, uh, outside income. But uh, I, I think that um, we can draw up ethics rules. I think there are certain things that you can mandate. If you are someone who is in a position to be deciding on a particular issue, I don't think there's any reason why you should be allowed to financially benefit from that. You know, in my job as a county chair, state chair, and any, any of the jobs, I, I've been fortunate because I have a business. I've never taken any income, directly or indirectly. People in my family don't get employed or no, none of that business. So, I, I, I mean, I'm talking from a different level, and it's not really fair because I do have outside income. These folks don't. But you have to be very careful to draw the um, ethics reform tightly so people understand what the rules are, what the do's are, and what the don'ts are, and, uh, and, and make it clear. And if you do that, I, I think we can live with it. Okay, let's talk a little about police reform while we have a couple of seconds here. Obviously, the governor has called for everybody to give a plan for their community and the rest. Are you optimistic? I'm hopeful. Like, as an example, this, this weekend, uh, I am bringing together privately and quietly members of the clergy and our minority communities here in Nassau County and uh, members of the uh, local PBA, not the, uh, the leadership uh, of the police in terms of the formal leadership, but the PBA, the, the, the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, detectives, superior officers. They're going to be getting together because <clears throat> I've asked them to and sit down to get to talk and, and know one another, build relationships because, <clears throat> excuse me, we've got problems, I'm sure, still coming ahead of us. And I want to make sure that our reactions to those problems lead us to positive outcomes rather than more division. And as the party leader, uh, I felt that I had an opportunity outside of politics because I had the relationships to bring these people together. And they were anxious to do it on both ends. And I'm happy and gratified about that. I'm looking forward to that meeting and more meetings after that. I think <clears throat> the main thing to remember is this. Police have a tough job, and it's a job where every day you, you go out, uh, you leave your family, you kiss your wife or your husband, and you go into 
for your job and you just don't know for a certainty that you're going to come back. I, I don't have that stress in my job. Uh, I believe every day that I've got no problem uh, like they have. So I respect that. You know, on the other hand, you, you know, you, you've got these kids in the African-American community who every, every day get in their car to go out and get something. And unfortunately, they have to worry about whether or not they're going to run into the wrong police officer, uh, uh, and there are uh, hopefully not many of them, but there are enough, obviously, and things are going to go awry, and they're not going to come back. We have to stop that. There's just too much fear, and that's what's driving this, fear on both sides. Jay Jacobs, is New York doing enough on climate change? Well, we can always do more. Everybody has to do more. And and not just the state, individuals. If you can put a solar system in your in your house, you should do it. We're looking at it. I'm looking at it for my business. Everybody has got to do a part. It's not just the state. We all own a piece of this. We're all a piece of this larger world of ours, and we've got to help out. So look around, see what you can do to conserve and get off carbon uh, fuels and uh, and um, make the planet a better better place. Everybody should do it. And make some sacrifices as a born and bred Fire Islander, actually in Manhattan, but Fire Island forever. I am now interested in the fact that you can sit on that beach and you can see uh, windmills and people are going to have to eat that, right? Unfortunately, yeah, that's right. I mean, we'd like to be able to sit on the beach. If the beach doesn't exist anymore, then you're not going to be sitting on it either. <laughs> Quite right. We've been talking to the wonderful Jay Jacobs. Jay, thank you so much for taking all this time with us. It's always fun to be with you, and we hope that you'll come back and talk to us some more in the future. Same here. I've enjoyed it. I really have. Thank you. Support comes from New York State United Teachers, a union of professionals standing with more than 600,000 workers in education, human services, and health care with the Our Voice, Our Values, Our Union campaign. And United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, uupinfo.org.